welcome. I see folks joining slowly into the space. I see that number ticking up. Um, and I think to maximize our time, we'll get started and dive right in right now. Um, so welcome to the first network book forum at Dane Society of the year on queer data studies. My name is Joan Mukagosi. I am a research analyst on the Trustworthy Infrastructures team at Data and Society, and I will be the host and the moder moderator of today's discussion. Um, this event is supported by our network engagement associate, Ireti Akinrenade, and our assistant producer, Tunika Onikakami. Um, so for those who are joining us for the first time, Data and Society is an independent research institute. We study the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and we convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and the purpose of technology in society. Our esteemed guests today are Nikita Shepard and Harris Pornstein. They are two of the essay essayists featured in Queer Data Studies. Nikita Shepard is a historian of LGBTQ communities, gender, sexuality, and race, social movements, data and surveillance, the carceral, carceral state, and radical politics in the 20th century United States and beyond. Harris Kornstein is a scholar and an artist whose research and art practice focuses on digital culture, surveillance, data and algorithms, media, art and activism, vis visual culture, disability and queer theory. We are also joined today by Patrick Kielty, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Information and Cinema Studies, and sorry, the Cinema Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Um, so we're, we greatly appreciate you guys tuning in today to hear from these authors about their book um, and its insights. You can get your own copy of Queer Data Studies at our affiliate link, which will be in the chat. Um, and please, as we begin our discussion, start thinking about your own questions and post them in the Q&A section throughout the event. Um, and feel free to leave comments as well about what comes up for you in the chat. So Queer Data Studies is an anthology that gathers authors from a broad range of disciplines and analytical approaches to explore the impact of data systems and practices on queer subjects. The essays draw from a range of disciplines, including queer theory, science and technology studies, history, and black studies, each providing an engaging examination of the contradictions, limits, and possibilities of queer data. So I'm going to pass it on to Patrick, the anthology, the anthology's editor, um, whose research interests can be divided into two areas, the politics of digital infrastructures in the sex industries and the materiality of sexual media. Patrick is going to start us off with a bit more about the book. Thanks, Joan. Um, yeah, I'm really honored to be here and I wanna thank Data and Society and um, Tanika and Areti and Joan for their dazzling organizational skills. Um, yeah, I'm really thrilled uh, uh, to be working with all of you and to be in conversation with Harris and Nikita. Um, so the book sort of started in part because uh, my university was becoming really interested in data science, a new program for uh, popping up all over the place in that area. And this was at the same time that uh, Donald Trump was elected in 2016. Um, and I was part of, and I'm still part of, uh, the Techno Science Research Unit at U of T, which is a queer indigenous feminist science lab. And some of the folks uh, who are part of the lab are historians of environmental science, and they were really concerned that um, that the data on the Environmental Protection Agency's website was going to be scrubbed by the new administration um, when they transitioned to, um, to you know, basically a, a typical administration transitions into power and revamps the executive branch's websites. But this particular incoming administration had it out for the EPA. And there was a lot of EPA data that was only available um, on their website. It was federally funded research that we worried would uh, basically not be available. And so we kind of created this um, 
uh, event called Guerrilla Archiving, Saving Environmental Data from Trump. And uh, we worked with the Internet Archive to sort of do a deep crawl of some of these government websites. And it just kind of got me thinking about the politics of data. Um, there were books coming out like Feminist Data um, uh, and Data Feminisms that, that um, were really influential, I think, to thinking about this book. And I just wanted to sort of uh, think about what it would mean to um, think queer subjects and data, think about long histories of queerness and data. What does it mean to queer data? Uh, you know, everything from irregular data to um, queer people's data. Um, but I was also just thinking about all the different genealogies you could trace from queer archival studies to queer science and tech studies, especially um, things around epidemiology and the AIDS pandemic um, to surveillance and policing. Um, and of course, Shock McLaughlin's Black Data, which had come out in a, um, a book earlier. Um, they were all sort of, they all kind of got me thinking about the different genealogies one could trace um, about queer data. And I think this book beautifully reflects those genealogies because it brings together lots of different people who are relying on disparate um, uh, literatures, but that are um, also in conversation with one another. So that's sort of how the book began. Thanks for that backstory. Um, and I'd love to give space for Nikita and Harris to talk about um, a bit more about your sections of the book. Nikita, I wonder if you could start us off um, and also help us frame this broader conversation around data visibility, invisibility in a historical context. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, huge thanks to Joan, Ireti, Tunika, and the rest of the folks at Data and Society. Um, Patrick, thank you for your incredible work coalescing this anthology. And I also wanted to thank Sarah Igo, the incredible historian of privacy in the modern US, who first alerted me to the call for papers that became this anthology. So um, I'm a historian. And for me, this chapter began the way that so many history adventures begin, by finding something unexpected in an archive that made me curious. So a few years ago, I was digging through some gay activist papers, and I found uh, the first national gay rights platform that was developed by activists in 1972 in the US. Now, on this platform, most of the issues were familiar things, decriminalization of same-sex sex, anti-discrimination protections, marriage rights, et cetera. But there was one thing that jumped out at me. This platform demanded uh, executive orders, regulations, and legislation banning the compiling, maintenance, and dissemination of information on an individual's sexual preference, behavior, and social and political activities for dossiers and data banks. So I thought, that's interesting. And I wondered if maybe that was just sort of a fluke or a one-time thing. But then, in another archive, in another random folder, I found the a paper from the George McGovern campaign, this was the 1972 Democratic presidential candidate, who was the first national presidential candidate to take a position on gay rights. And one of the seven planks in his gay rights platform was government and private investigatory agencies should cease to collect data on the sexual preferences of individuals. Now, this got me very curious. Because if you look at things like, for example, the uh, National LGBTQ Task Force's Queer the Census campaign, things that are going on today, we have something that seems like quite the opposite, where LGBTQ organizations are saying, no, we want to be counted, we want to be made into data. Whereas 50 years ago, it seemed like there was something totally different going on, where gay and lesbian activists were saying that they didn't want to be surveilled, counted, made into data in these sorts of ways. So this was the question that led me to the chapter that's in this book, where I wanted to figure out where did this demand for a ban on sexual orientation data, where did it come from? What, what was the political and the historical context and where did it go? Why is it no longer with us today? And are there any lessons that we can learn from this history? So uh, the chapter starts in the post-World War II United States looking at sort of the web of sexual surveillance that uh, took place from World War II up through the 1960s, where some people may be familiar with things like the Lavender Scare, the federal government's effort to sort of surveil and expel lesbian and gay employees, or possibly with the FBI's Sex Deviates Program, which collected over 300,000 files on uh, Americans and their sexual behavior. 
But what's less well known is the way that this was just the tip of the iceberg of this massive web of surveillance infrastructure that was uh, largely private, largely private investigators, private companies, uh, along with police departments on all different levels. And um, so I kind of tracked the ways that this sort of interlinked web of surveillance constrained the lives of gay and lesbian people and also the ways that folks resisted. Um, from there, when we look at the Stonewall Rebellion and the emergence of uh, gay liberation activism, one of the first groups to emerge in this time period was the Gay Activist Alliance here in New York City. And uh, that group had an employment discrimination committee that started tracking the ways that um, private investigation firms, uh, police departments, and things like that were using this data on people's sexual orientation to uh, deny people jobs, deny them housing, deny them insurance or bonding, um, and all sorts of other consequences. So this group started a campaign um, in, uh, the, with the New York City Human Rights Commission to try to address this, formulated this demand, um, networked with other activist groups around the country, got this demand into this 1972 national platform, and from there managed to work with other activists to get it all the way up to the McGovern campaign. So in that sense, there's sort of a fairly clear trajectory that led to this becoming a demand. How it ceased to be a demand is a little bit more complicated, but it has to do with a number of factors, including the sort of the peaking of public interest and concern around privacy and surveillance in the early mid 1970s, including of course the AIDS epidemic and the way that um, medical data was used in that time. Um, and then also a shifting relationship between the LGBTQ movements and the state where these sort of questions about what are the risks or costs of being made into data are being balanced against what are the potential benefits or what does uh, you know, our community or our movement feel like we could gain. So what I feel like I learned from doing this research is that for queer communities as it is for many marginalized communities, data is a double-edged sword. There are vulnerabilities that come from being counted, from being surveilled, from being included, but then there's also harms that can come from being excluded, from not being counted. And so uh, in this chapter, I tried to look at the ways that that changed over time historically, and also to try to find in this uh, gesture from the 1970s, uh, if there's some lessons that we could think about in terms of the kind of strategic opacity that some activists adapted to avoid surveillance, to challenge data, and to reimagine the way that um, sexuality, identity, and information can interact in the modern United States. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and I wonder, Harris, if you could now hop in and tell us more about your chapter of the book as well. Yeah, I, I just want to echo everyone's thanks. This is, uh, it's a great crowd to be in and, and wonderful organizers to support this event. Um, and I also just want to shout out Data and Society because um, I actually workshopped my chapter um, that ended up being in this volume at a Data, Data and Society event uh, a few years ago. Um, so yeah, so I guess I'll just briefly say that my kind of overall work and in, in this chapter um, especially are really looking at ways that queer and trans communities um, kind of existing social practices, you know, counter different forms of surveillance and, and other digital harms. Um, so I'm really sort of looking towards, you know, what are we in some ways already doing, even if we're, even if we're not necessarily thinking about these um, as in response to or in relation to um, digital technologies. Uh, but but how can we sort of think about new um, or, or existing tactics? And so my case study um, looks at a queer car service called Homobiles, which was started in the San Francisco Bay Area in 2010 uh, by kind of a uh, queer homocore punk legend, Lenny Breedlove. Um, and it was started as a kind of DIY punk project, um, kind of similar in some ways to, to other safe ride programs, but but really kind of seeking to be more of a general car service, ser uh, serving people uh, in the nightlife, you know, drag performers, sex workers, um, also supporting people in getting to medical appointments, all sorts of things. Um, and what was interesting to me about this case study is that it the service really emerged at around the same time, um, and and in some cases just before you know what we kind of think of now as the dominant uh, rideshare platforms like Uber and Lyft, and and there's some evidence uh, that Homobiles directly inspired some of these companies and and some of the competitors that no longer exist. Um, 
But, you know, in that kind of punk um, DIY, DIY ethos, it was a service um, that, you know, operated on a sliding scale. No one turned away for lack of funds, suggested donation kind of model. Um, and what I'm interested in in my chapter is really thinking about um, how this service, you know, queered data practices by, in many ways, just not following the playbook of Silicon Valley, right? And of really kind of being rooted in uh, the queer and trans values of the San Francisco community at the time. Uh, and so I, I kind of theorize uh, this case study in terms of intimacy and ephemerality and ignorance. Um, so sort of thinking, you know, through uh, a lot of the the queer writings around what does it mean to, to not um, hold on to something? What does it mean to not ask for something in the first place? What does it mean to, to work on a sort of need to know basis? Um, and so in some ways it's it's sort of reiterating I would say a very simple principle of of refusal of of sort of just not engaging in those terms. Um, and so, so yeah, so I'm interested in you know how this car service, um, you know, basically didn't build an app, didn't build technology, chose to work in this kind of DIY model um, based on bike messengers and and kind of traditional taxi dispatch. You know, it used text messages, it used phone calls, it used paper clipboards with. Um, you know, handwritten notes of of where to pick people up and when and all these sorts of things. Um, it explicitly didn't retain uh, data about users. It didn't try to use, uh, you know, any sort of data to optimize routes or to figure out how to better, um, you know, expand the service or, or kind of take this God's eye view that, um, you know, Uber and Lyft really explicitly uh, talk about in some of their marketing. Um, and instead really kind of focus on serving the needs um, of this community. Um, and, and I also look a little bit too at, at this kind of question of intimacy and safety, um, which I know is also kind of a theme, uh, especially now in data and society. But, you know, what does it mean to move away from, uh, you know, uh, kind of algorithmic rating systems and, and governance systems, um, but to really kind of think about trust on a small scale um, and to, to invite some of the kind of queer play um, that I think is also important in these conversations in terms of, you know, drag performers doing performances in the backs of cars and and taking the party home with you by, you know, singing along to your favorite queer songs and things like that. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe I'll, I'll stop there for now, but I'm, I'm excited to keep talking with you all. So am I. Um, I was going to say, I think something that really excites me about having you both here in conversation with us um, is the different approaches you take to this idea of refusal. Uh, Nikita, like navigating that double edged sword, right? Um, being excluded and included and what the sort of harms and benefits um, what kinds of harms, harms and benefits happen on each side of that spectrum of inclusion. Um, and then Harris, your case, um, more contemporary case in terms of like this creation of an external or like separated service, um, I think is really fascinating. And I think also in this present context where um, data systems that sort of represent uh, queer identity uh, and sexuality real or otherwise um, in data often dictate um, how we move through various systems, borders, carceral systems, um, and also like our daily digital worlds. Um, and so this question of refusing the harms um, that these systems might project onto queer people um, is something that's often centered on individuals, right? You can opt out of different types of data collection. You can choose not to represent yourself in data um, or they're placed on companies um, like tech companies or social media companies to, to protect their users. Um, but what I think is one of the most amazing things about queer data studies as an anthology is this approach to how we can sort of think about um, different techniques, different strategies of refusal, of resistance um, that are built by and for queer communities. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk more about those techniques. I'm, I, I, this is open to everybody. Um, yeah. I can speak to that a little bit in the historical context. So um, everyone is familiar with this metaphor of the closet. But not everyone knows that the closet is a more recent metaphor for LGBTQ communities. Kind of in the late 60s, and particularly in the 70s, became kind of the dominant metaphor that folks used to talk about this process of sort of managing information and disclosure around sexual identity. 
In the 1950s and 60s, it was much more common for people to speak about the mask or the double life. And uh, it wasn't so much a sort of binary opposition of in the closet, out of the closet, so much as a way of sort of being strategically uh, sharing information about one's sexuality, one's identity uh, with the people you wanted to know and withholding it from the people you didn't want to know, including state agencies, private companies, things like that. And that's something I've thought a lot about coming out of this research is um, this sort of strategic opacity or the selective visibility where there's been some very interesting work in queer studies, trans studies, um, as well as black studies in other areas about sort of this, the, the sort of tensions around visibility as a, uh, as a, as an ethical norm or sort of a political aspiration. And, um, and I think about that in relation to what Harris was saying about the sort of need to know basis, right? Um, and, uh, that was, you know, this was coming in a context in the 1950s, 1960s, where um, it was possible to make, for many people, to maintain more control over one's information. Now, to in the sort of current mass surveillance big data environment we're in, that's very different. And, um, and one of the things that's posing uh, particular challenges to sort of strategies of resistance or refusal is the way that sort of algorithmic triangulation enables there to be uh, types of surveillance that don't even necessarily require you to disclose, for example, your sexual orientation or something like that. But I, I teach undergraduates at Columbia and Barnard who um, often speak about how, uh, I've heard this phrase, TikTok knows you're gay before you do, which um, uh, seems to be a very widely shared sentiment. And humor aside, I think what that's gesturing towards is this idea that these recommendation algorithms that a lot of social media feeds are, are generating take all these different data points, none of which have to be an actual disclosure that you are trans or queer or whatever else, but through this massive web of analysis of consumer behavior, viewing behavior, page time, you know, all these sorts of things will, um, in some cases, frighteningly accurately uh, triangulate people as being part of or adjacent to particular identity groups in terms of sexuality or gender. So um, the kinds of strategies for managing information and disclosure that the historical subjects that I was looking at just don't really work in our contemporary big data environment. So that's why I'm interested in, in thinking with people like Harris and, and these questions about what does a queer ethic of sort of refusal or resistance and engaging with data look like in a very different data and information environment? Yeah, and maybe I'll add, you know, I I guess I, I this is sort of the core of my work is sort of looking for these other models. And I, I look towards, you know, other scholars um, like Bo Ruberg, who's working on queer play or Sarah Ahmed, who's working on queer use um, or, you know, Kara Keeling and others work on um, queer OS and, and try to think, and, and I guess I'll say the framework that I'm sort of thinking about is what I'm calling um, queer enchantment, but, but these sort of ways of, of playfully, of mischievously, of, um, campily, you know, kind of with a winking eye, uh, you know, addressing some of these these concerns around um, privacy or visibility. And um, I think like Nikita said, in many ways, I'm less interested in, um, you know, in sort of discourses of, of hiding or concealment or um, withholding information. And um, I've also been interested in, in theories like uh, Ben Brunton and Helen Nissenbaum's work on obfuscation and sort of what does it mean um, to put so much information out there or to be, you know, so visible and so dazzling that it's sort of hard to parse and make sense of all of this information uh, that's that's kind of coming at you. And so um, in addition to the, the chapter that I have in this uh, book, I've also worked a lot on drag and sort of think about um, drag performers as as both real life examples and, and drag in some ways as a metaphor um, for some of these things, you know, of of what does it mean to to have a very highly visible, you know, literally kind of look at me um, public persona, um, but that still kind of plays a little bit with, you know, questions of truth and fiction and, um, you know, all sorts of binaries, not just masculinity and femininity, um, to really kind of get a little bit of that kind of confusion, that doubt, that um, messiness that I think is actually more um, realistic in terms of how we live our lives than than the sort of neat ordered databases um, might otherwise 
suggest. Um, and oh, there was one other thing that I was going to say, and I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, I was also just going to say too to to Nikita's point. You know, I the the sort of TikTok uh, knows you're gay before you do stuff is is also so interesting to me because I, I remember there was a paper a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago, uh, kind of looking at how uh, based on Facebook data it was it was sort of easy to determine someone's sexual orientation. But the the data points were already so culturally coded, you know, it was like, do you listen to Lady Gaga? Do you listen to Katy Perry? Like, it's it's just this sort of absurd um, kind of disavowal of of any kind of like existing queer culture, queer norms, sense of um, intuition and interpretation that, um, I don't know, in some ways, I, I think we give the algorithms and, and the AI too much credit sometimes, too. Patrick, do you want to hop in? Well, I was just thinking, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's the, both of these points are, are they're, they're so great about this sort of, and I guess it lends itself to the title of our panel about invisibility and visibility. I mean, the book's introduction begins with this epigraph. It begins with two epigraphs, one from Jose Munoz and one from Sadia Hartman, which I think kind of sum up this um, queer paradox to data. Um, and I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll read both of them. So it, Jose Munoz writes the sort of introduction to a, a special issue of women in performance. Um, and the introduction is called Ephemera's Evidence. And he writes, queerness is often tr transmitted covertly. This has everything to do with the fact that leaving too much of a trace has often meant that the queer subject has left herself open for attack. Instead of being clearly available as visible evidence, queerness has instead existed as innuendo, gossip, fleeting moments and performances that are meant to be interacted with by those within its epistemological sphere while evaporating at the touch of those who would eliminate queer possibility. And I contrast that epigraph with Hartman's The Lost from Venus and Two Acts, the famous, um, if you haven't, this is like one of my all time favorite articles and I try to assign it all the time. Um, but um, in Venus and Two Acts, just the simple phrase, the simple sentence, the loss of stories sharpens our hunger for them. And I think in both cases, you're you're hearing both the way, you're hearing a kind of ambivalence um, that queer people have to data. Um, and while they can be data experts in some areas, um, evasion maybe, um, making um, tr queer traces available within a particular epistemological sphere. There are other ways in which queer people want to be counted and aren't being counted. And I think at one point I say in the introduction, you know, sometimes we want to be counted and sometimes we don't. And this kind of ambivalence, um, I think, is partly what comes through in, all, in a lot of the chapters in this book. And um, and yeah, I, I I was also struck by how many chapters were really touched on sort of moments of, of intimacy or of joy and how your relationship to whether you left a trace, whether you wanted to be counted had to do with questions of sort of proximity and vulnerable vulnerability. And um, and I think that came through in both Harris's and, and Nikita's chapter. Certainly. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm really struck by the wealth of contradictions and how I think enjoyable it is to sit in that space of, um, of, of being in between wanting to be seen, not wanting to be seen in those negotiations, negotiations, collective negotiations of when and where, um, it's not just appropriate, but also, um, powerful, uh, to be seen, um, again, on our own terms. Um, I think, you know, also like shouting out Shaka's essay again, and this concept of black data, um, one of my favorites uh, from the book as well. Um, and this idea of, of, of responding to big data's call. Um, I think again, Nikita, you're talking about like this, these, like the network of, of algorithms that sort of dictate a lot of our, our movements online. And then Harris also that point of not wanting to put too much power in the hands of those algorithms when um, trying to move through these digital worlds. Um, and so I'm wondering if we could talk more about what it means to approach the querying of data th from that generative or almost like speculative space, right? Um, this idea that when you approach data systems from queer perspectives, 
um, that there can be this production of really like fruitful and cr like creative, uh, I think I said speculative already, um, but these like inventive modes um, of like not just being data subjects, right? But like having that uh, agency. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about how that's uh, perhaps explored um, in your chapters or beyond in your work. Yeah, I can maybe start here. Um, yeah, so I was mentioning before some of my other work on on drag and uh, surveillance, and and um, one of the things that I'm interested in, especially, is how drag makeup uh, kind of confuses facial recognition algorithms, um, which is you know not something that drag makeup is designed to do, but is kind of this um, you know fun uh, I don't know kind of byproduct. Um, but I think kind of speaks to that that sense of creativity that um, you know that that again we can be playful that we don't necessarily ne need to be hiding our faces or um, you know putting masks on quite literally but um, but that we can you know engage these existing cultural practices that that do bring us joy that do bring us visibility that like literally transform us um, but also still kind of allow us to to maintain certain truths and to to kind of you know, maybe exaggerate ourselves into um, the kind of lives that we want to lead. Um, so I think that that's one example. And and I guess I'll also just say um, in our kind of pre-conversation about this talk, we were talking a little bit about um, teledildonics, which is something that um, Patrick has been working on. Um, and just briefly for folks who aren't familiar, it's sort of like uh, technologically enabled sex toys, right? It's like, you know, networked or, or data driven sex toys and things like that. Um, and, you know, we were sort of joking, you know, like, what would it, what would it look like if, you know, rather than the sort of typical data that gets collected and bought and sold about us, you know, what if we were looking at things like, you know, the size preferences of your dildos or, or, you know, how long you've used them or things like that. Um, and I guess that's sort of like my provocation is like, what if we clear data by taking some of these Clear data points more seriously. I'm I'm not sure that I want algorithms or or AI to like, you know, be fed and run off those things. Um, but I'm also curious what it would look like if if they did, right? Or you know, if you know, we used um, our astrological signs as like a jumping off point rather than you know our last ten purchases or things like that. And you know, I guess that's also not to say that those data points aren't being used. Maybe they are already. Um, but but what if we sort of weighted them differently or, or took them more seriously? I guess is is my question. Great provocation. I don't know, Patrick or Nikita, do you want to? I'll just say. I mean, one of the reasons I brought this up in our pre conversation was. I was struck recently at the Adult um, Novelty Expo in Las Vegas, um, not the most recent one, but the one before that, about how many teledildonic companies are advertising their data security. And they will, like, on the packaging of the box, they'll have, like, a little shield with a circle around it. And I just thought it was interesting, and I was trying to think of what was going on in this world um, where data privacy, data security is suddenly a marketing tool. And um, what I was thinking of, and I kind of referenced this earlier, was about um, the way your the way certain kinds of data, especially data that's intimate, is something that people um, feel this sort of sense of vulnerability toward. And um, there's an acute vulnerability there. And I think that that, that has become a marketing strategy for some companies. Um, but I was also just trying to think more broadly about what does intimacy and data, what are the relationships between intimacy and data? And I know Nikita brings some of this up in, in their um, chapter um, because so much of that surveillance data was intimate, right? Incredibly personal. So let Nikita go. Yeah, one, one way I'm thinking about your question, Joan, is um, in 2017, there was a very controversial study that was released claiming that facial recognition technology could accurately predict people's sexual orientations. Now, I've read this study and it is very spurious on a lot of levels methodologically, but, um, but it does pose a lot of intriguing and kind of troubling questions about, uh, about data. So on one level, there's the sort of, you know, privacy or protection against intrusive surveillance or the negative uses to which it could be put could be put 
But then there's another angle that has to do with interpretation. It has to do with how do we read the material that's coming up in the form of data and organize it into perceptions of sexuality, gender, identity, things like that. And one of the most fascinating things that I found in the historical research I did was that particularly in this, in this sort of radical moment in the late 60s, early 70s, right around Stonewall, gay liberation, when folks were really radically rethinking um, gender, sexuality, identity, intimacy, kinship, was that one of the concerns that people had about the collection of data was not just the negative uses to which it could be put, although those were very real and very harmful, but also this idea that sexual orientation data was a way of sort of constraining the possibilities of what queerness could be, of sort of putting it in a box, putting it in a frame, putting it in a particular data framework that would interpret our experiences and organize them in a particular way that was aligned with, you know, the interests of consumer culture, aligned with patriarchy, aligned with the nuclear family, et cetera, et cetera. And that some of the more interesting and kind of radical critiques that were coming up at this time was arguing that um, part of the reason to resist being made into data in these ways was so that we could have a more radically open-ended and self-determined sense of what in their case gay could mean, or in our case today queer or trans or non-binary or et cetera could mean. So echoing sort of what Paris was saying earlier, the problem with the algorithms isn't necessarily that, you know, uh, they sort of position our music taste and our consumer behavior or whatever and sort of, you know, uh, predict certain things based on that, but that they interpret those predictions in these sort of narrow identity-based categories when there's so many more possibilities for who we could be, who we could become that aren't necessarily constrained by what we can tick on a form. And that's not necessarily to say that's, you know, what, what freedom or liberation means is just sort of an increasing number of categories, but rather um, that for me, part of a queer data practice is a critical relationship, not only to the particular data points that are being gathered, but to the interpretive frameworks that we use to organize them in the ways that they can constrain the possibilities of freedom, sexuality, gender expression, and all the rest. That's amazing, Nikita. Thank you for that. Um, I want to get back to this idea of vulnerability and intimacy in a moment. So put a pause on that mentally. But before I wanted to go back, Patrick, like this idea that you have these, um, like teledildonics companies framing privacy as a, as a selling point, um, is really fascinating. And I think like this idea that like, even your sex toys are not free. They're up for grabs. That data is up for grabs. Um, it's really interesting to me. Um, and I think, again, like we, we talked about this previously. Sorry if you can hear the siren going. I live in New York City, folks. Um, but I love how we could talk more about like operating from that space, that knowledge, um, that that safety and privacy are not guaranteed, uh, particularly for queer people online and in other uh, digital uh, spaces. Um, and sort of flipping that approach um, from like what it means to secure uh, data infrastructures to what it means to operate in a space, to navigate in a world in which that security is not a guarantee. Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that even before the internet, queers have done, right? There's a way in which cruising in a park is a form of shared vulnerability. And it kind of comes back to Munoz's quote that, that you there are gestures that indicate your sort of um, status or preference or um, right that are available only to those within an epistemological sphere. And so there are ways in which queers have developed strategies for both um, revealing themselves and staying uh, opaque um, when they need to that are really strategic. Um, if you think of other sort of queer spaces, um, you know, there's a, like bathhouses. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I think, queer spaces where you can think about how shared vulnerability has uh, is a guiding ethics to how people relate to the world and others. And it's possible to think from that approach of shared vulnerability in online contexts. Um, but I'll hand it over to Harris and Nikita to elaborate. 
Yeah, I mean, in in the chapter that I've uh, contributed to this book on homobiles, I do have the section sort of thinking about um, really the small scaleness and and what does it mean to kind of preserve that that um, sense of community ties and social relations and and to not rely on the sort of anonymity of um, you know uh, user generated reviews and things like that um, and and again in some ways that feels sort of simplistic or or almost overly idealistic to think that we could kind of go back to that but it, it's something that I do sort of want us to take more seriously of you know what does it mean to to really rely on those social relations to build that sense of security um and and maybe how could we scale that up right like maybe it's not necessarily about who do I know but it's about who do I know that knows these other people or or sort of what are my perceptions of being uh related to and part of this community and and what are the kind of you know uh social ramifications if I violate certain core values or certain principles or certain elements of trust um so yeah I, I think that that's sort of that's where my contribution comes in here um and I guess the the other thing that I'm thinking about too in terms of cruising um is I'm also interested in kind of connecting this back to our question on uh, earlier about creativity and uh yeah, sort of maybe less reactive ways of, of responding to some of these. You know, I also think about how there's there's there are new apps and companies that are trying to sort of uh, bring that spirit of cruising into a more digital context. You know, I think about um, like Lex, which is sort of the survival of more narrative based personals, um, you know, in more kind of lesbian, queer women, trans non-binary communities. Um, in like gay male communities, there's Sniffies, right? Which is like this relatively new um, not app because it won't, it doesn't conform to the kind of uh, crude standards of the Apple store uh, or app store. Um, and and kind of allows for, again, the sense of, of, you know, public visibility of very certain materials, AKA dick pics and things like that, um, while still, you know, allowing users to sort of negotiate how they want to present themselves and interact with other people. Um, so there's kind of this, you know, potential vulnerability in sharing your location, you know, in sharing whatever parts of your body <laughs> you might be sharing, um, but also, again, kind of having that that negotiation. And I guess maybe that's sort of what I'm looking for more of is is less the sort of like policy and more the kind or the the procedures um, that are kind of built into these, um, not just data processing algorithms, but, you know, kind of more procedural aspects of the kinds of technologies that we use. Um, and instead this more kind of like one-to-one -one or community to community form of negotiation. Awesome. Um, so I think we have time for one last quick question before we dive into audience questions. Um, and going back to this idea, Patrick, I loved you talking about like this shared vulnerability as an, as an ethic, as a practice, right? Um, and I think, you know, I'll, the essays in the book, like sort of some of them approach this idea of like that querying data requires like this expression of vulnerability on behalf of queer people in a, in a lot of cases. And I'm wondering if you talk, uh, Patrick, about like what a queer informed approach to data systems tells us about like how we can balance on one hand, the dangers of like un unintended exposure and breaches of trust and privacy that come from vulnerability. But then at the same time, like this liberation that can come from that same practice. Yeah, I mean, um, yes, <laughs> I think it's both, right? I think um, there's a way in which a shared vulnerability almost uh, creates shared cultural forms, right? That create that help to form a help to form a community, um, and so there's something kind of um, important about that in terms of being seen. There's ways in which sharing your vulnerability is a way of um, I guess, connecting with someone, right? Um, where there's a kind of like relation where you like, you see someone in yourself, right? There's a kind of signifying a potential. 
right? We talk about interpolation or we talk about like surveillance, but in, in like say a cruising context to bring it back to that context, you know, cruising is surveillance, <laughs> right? Um, and so there's something, there can be something liberating actually about being surveilled by the right people in the right context, right? By people you wanna be surveilled by. Um, but that requires a certain vulnerability on your part. And I agree with Harris, it requires a certain kinds of understanding of protocol and ethics. Um, maybe this is where feminist science comes in, where you know there, there is an understanding of the value of protocol, right? In order to create, um, in order to create uh, an equitable space, or a, a, um, uh, in order to create a space that where shared vulnerability doesn't become a violent space. Um, so I'll leave it there. And flip it. Thank you. Um, I think. I think we should dive into the Q and A portion and um, gather in audience questions. Um, so, looking in the uh, Q and A section, and we have a question here about the algorithmic fix. Um, so, this idea that instead of predicting the future, uh, algorithms seek to fix a future um, that is predictable. So, the question is, if someone could speak about this idea of fixing queer identities. Um, I think this was going off of Nikita, your example of TikTok, knowing, knowing you're gay before you do. Nikita, oh, do you want to hop in? Can you, can you say a little bit more about what the what's meant by the algorithmic fix? Yes. So this is um, from an author, Didem Oskol. I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. Um, she speaks in part about the idea of triangulating identities, um, but also the extent to which algorithms seek to fix and shape things. Um, so I guess what I'm gathering here is like this question of like, does TikTok know you're gay? <laughs> um, or is there this sort of like element of predictive, um, you are gay because TikTok says you're gay? <laughs> so to, to speak to that a little bit, um, it's a fascinating question, thank you. Um, it would seem to me that thinking through the lens of the 50 years ago, what these folks who were calling for a ban on the collection of sexual orientation data were trying to gesture towards is uh, in a way sort of a suspicion of something similar, which is that one of the things that the collection of data could do could be for these purposes of disciplining, correcting, fixing, things like that, and foreclosing possibilities. Um, one, of the, one of the real challenges of sort of like black box iterative systems where we are not able to, to be aware of exactly what sort of is going on behind the scenes and how algorithms are manipulating our sense of possibility is um, I think related to this historical process of trying to reimagine a wider sphere of possibilities for sexual and gender expression and identity and um, and one thing that I would like to see would be uh, in a contemporary big data environment. So the utopian possibility would be that there are so many different ways that people can use digital technologies to connect to each other, uh, to find increasingly precise forms of overlap in their experience, to find kind of resonance and affirmation across a wide range of lines of difference. Um, but in a technical system that is so oriented towards an attention economy quantifying logic of maximizing engagement, screen time, things like that. Um, that sort of can channel user behavior and channel sort of outputs from algorithmic inputs in very particular ways that aren't necessarily aligned with the values that we might have in terms of thinking about expansive queer possibilities. So, and this is beyond my own technical capacity, but I would be curious, uh, for folks who are sort of inspired by queer data approaches to think about what kinds of algorithmic resistance to these logics of the fix or sort of like channeling or narrowing identity possibilities um, could exist by taking advantage of the radically connective possibilities in, in queer technologies. Great answer, thank you for that. 
Um, okay, so we have another question um, about sentiment analysis. I think this is something that we kind of uh, gestured to a bit, um, but sentiment anal analysis, um, for example, is things like um, analysis during like the hiring process, tools that scan employees' digital written communications. Um, are there unique impacts of these tools on queer communities? Um, and like, could, if if not, like, if this is not something that um, you guys have directly um, examined in your work, speculating, could you guys speculate about the ways that um, this kind of analysis could potentially lead to harms against queer folks? Yeah, I guess I can say I haven't worked on this specifically, um, and my answer is not going to think as much about the harms. It, it it feels sort of like overwhelming to think about how many different op opportunities there would be there. Um, but what I guess I can say um, from my work is that I have sort of speculated along with the work that I've done on drag and facial recognition of how drag can kind of disrupt other forms of biometric um surveillance or or sentiment analysis. So, you know, I think kind of with a similar principle, you know, drag performers often change their gait, right? Like they, we change the way we walk in the world when we put on a, a pair of heels. We and and we do change the ways that we write and speak, right? Like we often have very kind of different colloquial vernaculars um that we speak in. And so so I guess from the the sort of how can we refuse or resist this, that that's one way that I think about is again kind of um not not hiding or masking or, or, you know, kind of permanently changing the ways that we operate in the world, but kind of thinking about that sense of a variability of how we speak to different audiences, to different people, um, and how that, you know, might hopefully make us just a little bit less traceable. While I haven't studied this in, uh, in the present tense, I can certainly say that that specific concern that you're raising is exactly what was motivating the historical actors that I study to create this provision uh, for a ban on sexual orientation data. It was specifically looking at employment discrimination and the ways that companies were using, um, you know, not not these sort of like uh, as technologically advanced ways as are available today, but um, using data on people's sexual orientation in this sort of like web of opaque and unaccountable institutions to uh, deny people access to employment that could render people like permanently unemployable or permanently impoverished. And so what I, and you know, and I, I grew up in the South, I lived most of my life in North Carolina and Tennessee. And when I look at things that are happening with bathroom bills and, you know, teachers being fired in Florida for being non-binary and things like this, like it certainly does not seem unrealistically dystopian to think that some of these high-tech tools in the wrong hands could do incredible damage to our communities. So to me, one of the things that this brings up is the possibility for coalitional organizing by thinking about the wide range of people who are harmed or excluded by algorithmic oppression in particularly in terms of hiring, but there's many other spheres, um, how even for those of us in LGBTQ communities who may not be aware of uh, the ways that we have been or could be targeted through these tools, to form coalitions with other marginalized communities to think about organizing, to push back against the use of these tools, to think about more equitable forms of hiring, of access to housing, access to resources, and uh, yeah, and use that as a possibility for political organizing that can span across lines of difference. Beautiful. Um, okay, I think we have time for at least one more question. Um, thank you, everybody, for your amazing questions. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this one word for word. As all the speakers have gestured towards, given the reality of structural discrimination, there's an asymmetry between the data needed to create a bias system, intentionally or not, and the data needed to detect bias. How do we think about this fact? Is there a role for technological solutions, like, for example, differential privacy? Gosh, that is such an important and challenging question, and I am not going to be able to answer it sufficiently. But what um, one thing I thought about uh, considering your question in the context of a queer data analysis is I'm thinking about Joy Bolomini's work on race and facial recognition and the deep ambivalence where on the one hand, is it more harmful for facial recognition te technology to work poorly on people of certain skin tones or 
is it more harmful for it to work really well, depending on how it's used, right? So, um, so this points to very different, both technical and political solutions to some of these problems. Um, are we looking to strengthen technical systems with more representative data sets to increase the accuracy of surveillance methods? Or should we be focusing on counter surveillance strategies or regulatory approaches that address the root cause of these potential harms? And of course, while there could be room for technical solutions in some of these things, there's also a much deeper issue of sort of cultural change and social change around the ways that we think about gender and sexuality and self-determination more broadly, and also in terms of the organization of power in political systems and who gets to make the decisions about all of these questions. Are we leaving it to tech companies? Are we leaving it to third party regulation? Or can we create grassroots structures that enable us to push back on some of these projects? I wanted to pause Harris or Patrick, if you wanted to touch on that. Cool. All right, then we have time for one more question. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading as fast as I can. Um, I think we got a question um, that like didn't appear in the Q and A um, about, so do we need to think more expansively about what images depict queer histories? Um, especially when that invisibility speaks to a culture of passing or secrecy uh, surrounding purge policies. I think that's a question for you, Nikita. Um, yeah, expanding images that uh, depict queer histories. I'm sorry, could you read one more time? Yes. Uh, do we th need to think more expansively about what images depict queer histories? Um, yeah. Sure. Um, one of the, yeah, one of the fascinating things um, to think about in terms of the relationship between images and queer history is that um, so much of what is legible as queer actually has to do with gender, has to do with what's gender nonconforming, which what seems to be sort of contesting norms, um, and that uh, can sort of overrepresent certain queer experiences, underrepresent other queer experiences. Um, but that also we think about sort of what has been visually captured and what hasn't, and how so much one of the sort of methodological challenges for historians of the queer past is how when people wanted to not be seen, to not be made into data, to not be counted, how difficult it is to access what was going on in that past. That's why things like oral history have been so important for learning about the past. Um, and unfortunately, particularly, you know, when we get to 7,500 years ago, so much of what we know has to do, ha, comes from criminal legal system records, from arrests, from trials, from things like that, from forms of data creation that were actively hostile and uh, actively intended to suppress and exterminate the communities and practices that we're interested in. Um, and that's one of the things that makes uh, sort of visual history is particularly important and particularly interesting and makes these questions of figuring out how we can represent them in their full diversity and look for them in unexpected places um, so incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, one of the themes in the book, too, is what to do with these right gaps in the archive. And I think that work of actually um, wielding back police data in the service of queer communities right, um, to tell queer stories is, I think, a form of kind of um, queer information activism, right, and a necessary part of, like, historical, historical work. Um, so it's interesting to think, you know, with, with Hartman about how to fill these gaps in the archive, and to think with, um, you know, Alyssa Richardson about, like, I mean, for her book about citizen journalism, right, about how, how you wield back data against an oppressor. Um, and oftentimes it's communities that are oppressed that know best how to wield back that data. They know best how, in fact, to handle something like police data. Um, so yeah, I think the archive history, historiography is incredibly a rich place, a rich genealogy for thinking queer data in the present. And maybe if I can just quickly jump in, I'll just say, I think this is also another interesting opportunity for kind of more generative responses. I'm I'm really interested in a lot of the 
not revisionist history, but the sort of um, attempts to recuperate or reimagine or revisualize or reperform some of these kind of histories that have, again, not been formally documented, but still kind of retained as the stuff of legends. So. Awesome. Um, well, there's so many questions in the q and A. I I am so sad we didn't get to get to all of them, um, but we will save them for the panelists um, so that you can go through them um, after we're done here. But I just want to extend a huge, huge uh, thank you to all of our pan panelists, Nikita, Harris, Patrick, um, everyone behind the scenes, Ereti, uh, Tunika, thank you so much for helping us put this on. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined today um, and those who will be watching the recording online. Um, and yeah, go out and grab the book. Um, you have the link in the chat as well. Um, thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.